Greetings out there in guitar modern land. When I first uh, discovered Leo Abrahams, it was probably through a video on YouTube of him doing something similar to what I like to do, which is improvising through a laptop with a guitar, through a laptop, using effects and looping uh, to create kind of ambient sounds. Um, as I looked into him some more, I realized that he had a much more varied and wider career than that and a uh, higher profile career than that. Uh, at one point I turned to my wife and said, I want this guy's life because uh, not only did he get to do performances of his ambient music and various other kinds of music using his laptop, he was a producer, he produced singer-songwriter, something I've done in the past and have liked to do. Uh, he also played with two of my favorite Brian's, Brian Ferry and Brian Eno and still does uh, to the extent that anyone's playing with anyone anymore. Uh, I was really happy to catch up with Leo. Uh, I would suggest going to my original interview in Guitar Modern to get more about his background, but uh, we were able to hook up in London the last time I visited, and we had a lovely dinner, and then went to see David Toop perform for his 70th birthday at Cafe Otto. Um, this was a chance to catch up on what he's been doing since, which includes two new records uh, that have come out in the last year. Both of them are terrific. So we talk about that. We talk about a lot of usages of gear and, and the trials and tribulations of playing through a laptop live and uh, a wealth of other things. So I hope you enjoy the interview. See you soon. There we go. So you Hello. were recording with... You were touring with John uh, Hopkins? Oh, yeah, back in March, which is when... Oh, are we recording this now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> you can ask me again, what was I doing? Yeah. <laughs> no, well, that's okay. No, just, okay. So, yeah, basically, the tour had been booked for ages, as these things always are. And I think at the beginning of the tour, we were just beginning to hear that there was something going on in China, but we were assured by our tremendous government that it was nothing to worry about. And we were about five dates into the tour, and it began to seem like, even though we weren't being told to stop our regular activities, it would probably be a good idea to do that. Um, and it made the shows quite weird, because everyone knew something was coming, and we probably lost 30% of the crowds, they were sold out shows, but but even though they were, the shows were allowed to happen, 30% of people decided to stay away. And the 70% that came, some were nervous, some were extremely hedonistic and sort of, in a positive way, defiant. And they were really extraordinary shows to play. I mean, it was also in the air that these might be the last shows for a long time, but it wasn't, it certainly wasn't celebratory. And um, yeah, our last show was, uh, it was a strange sort of energy. And um, we were due to play the Albert Hall the following week and then go on to Europe. And because of the way these things work, John was um, not able to clarify on Twitter or something exactly what was going on. It's all like contractual stuff. It's again, the government makes it very difficult for artists in these, in that particular situation. And yeah, we all just went home. Um, and I think some of us in the band actually had COVID actually, but we, it's just insane thinking back to the mindset back then with the information that we had, but we weren't, all that worried about it. I mean, the cello player had this terrible cough. She was coughing all the way through the gigs, but she was on the bus for the rest of us. You know, it's just, it feels like a different time. Well, do you think you had it? Did you get tested? Do you, um, do you have antibodies? Well, at the time there weren't tests, I guess. Right. So, I mean, it was really right back at the beginning. It seemed, it's interesting to think back to, what the mentality was like then. So as far as we were concerned, we had a, I didn't personally have a cough, but I had a, some sort of flu and this friend of mine, the cello player had a cough and then she recovered and we didn't think much more of it. 
Um, I mean, in this country, it was some time before uh, mass testing became available. Yeah. yeah. And we're dealing with it so well over here, though, I should. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Oh, well. Well, I think I think we're in the global uh, naughty on the global naughty step together. Yeah. Um, so yes. remind me, I, now, did you work with John Hopkins with Eno at one point? And what what kind of music is that? And did you record with him? And um... Well, actually, John Hopkins and I went to school together. And we used to, uh, he's a year younger than me, but we used to play together a lot and sometimes play in school assembly and play these like free form improvisations and stuff to much amusement and indifference. And then he, yeah, well, that's what happened. We both joined Imogen Heap's band at the same time because I, I knew her manager, Imogen's manager, because he'd been the manager of my childhood hero who I'd sometimes bother with my appalling demo tapes and this kind of thing. But somehow he remembered me from those days when I was 14 and said, do you want to audition for Imogen? And I got the job and she said, do you want, do you know any keyboard players? And I said, well, there's this guy, John, he's really good. And he got the job and we toured with Imogen for a year or so. And by the end of that, in our different ways, we were both kind of making a go of it. And then, um, a few years later, I met Brian by accident in a guitar store. And um, he also asked me, do you know any keyboard players? And I said, well, there's this guy, John, he's really good. <laughs> and uh, it's, it, yeah, it sort of started this association. And that's what eventually led to John's association with Coldplay. And the rest is history, as they say. Oh, OK. So he became their keyboard player at some point. Well, he wrote they actually took one of his pre-existing tracks and and used it as a backing track for a song on Viva La Vida. And he and they took him on tour as their opening act. Um, I mean, he was already successful by then in his own right, but it certainly helped. And um, yeah, it's just kind of amazing because I've, I've known him for such a long time and he really he's someone who has not compromised or second guessed himself or played any sort of game he's just done what he's always done since he was 15 years old and it's reached the world and it's it's really just wonderful that is wonderful and you know much the same could be seen like it could be said about you i mean you know um I'm, not really i'm a more, I'm a more backstage guy <laughs> well, oh but well yeah you're a backstage guy but i mean you're not as uh, perhaps i mean look i i don't know who John Hopkins is. I'm, you know, I'm not a Coldplay fan, so I, I don't know. And you know, the circles I run in, I we don't know who he is. So it, I, I'm sure he's incredibly famous in certain circles, but in the circle, in my circles, you know, you have an amazing career that seems to not have required a lot of compromise and just be you being whoever you are at any given point. Which I, you know, yeah, no, no I'm definitely not. Um... I'm definitely not uh, bemoaning my lot, <laughs> but I've, I've been very lucky. But I think with John, yeah, I suppose he's an artist, you could say, whereas I'm more of a collaborator. Um, and it was interesting to see that divergence happen because at the at the beginning I thought, well, maybe I maybe I will be an artist or try and be an artist, but I just didn't. It wasn't quite right for me. Like, I, I don't know if I really had it in me uh, at the time anyway. And also, I really liked being a cog in a machine, you know, or being the person who helped birth other people's projects. I found that very fulfilling. Whereas for John, he, well, with some exceptions, he found that's kind of a big pain in the ass. Um, yeah. Well, that said, though, I mean, uh, you've done, you have done amazing work as a side person, but you have put out a number of records under your own name. And, uh, hmm. you know, they're not particularly pop oriented, most of them. So, you know, you, you haven't entered that world and, you know, gained the kind of notoriety that you can from that. But, you know, as I say, in my world, you know, you're an artist who happens to also do side, you know, be a sideman as well, because right, you know, right. what we're here to talk about today 
for example, is your work as an artist as much as mm. a sideman. Um, because, uh, well, let's start talking about that. Why not? Um, so apparently you did two records last year. And uh, mm. which came first, <laughs> Visitations or um, or Chrononaut? Chrononaut. Chrononaut. Well, they both kind of bubbled up at the same time. Um, they were both started and completed at more or less the same time, they had, although they had quite different workflows. Um, they were gradual projects, uh, not because they took a long time in terms of total number of days, but because the people I was working with, I'd only see um, sporadically. So Visitations is a duets record with Shazad Ismaili, and um, I'd see him once every six months, and that record is made from three sessions that we did in two in London and one in New York. Um, and then I took it all away and just compiled it and mixed it. And Chrononaut was made out of two sessions that happened, I think, a year apart, actually. Um, it's kind of a collaboration with a drummer called Martin France, and then it has guest musicians on. Um, but both records are completely improvised and both records are effectively live in that there's no overdubs and um, very little editing. And yeah, it was a it was a big relief for me in a way to work like that. I'd, I'd made one other collaboration record called Amoral Avatar with a great drummer called Chris Vatilara, which came out um, a few years previously. And I think I was well, on the one hand, a bit tired of writing or suspicious of writing. And on the other hand, there was a convergence of two things that I'm very much interested in musically. One of them's the composer Morton Feldman, and the other is this traditional um, religious music uh, from Central Asia called Mado. And somehow these things sort of cross-fertilized for me and opened up some new principle for improvising. And um, whenever I told my friends about it, like Shazad or Martin, they were excited about it too. And we tried it and that's just how those things happened. So that's interesting. So, so was uh, Shazad, when he was in London, would, you, would he work both on the Chrononaut and the Visitations record during the same period? Would you guys do sessions for both? No. Um, Oh, maybe yes. It was actually some time ago. It's a couple of years ago. Yeah. I think, yes, he was in town for something else. Like these aren't the kinds of projects that you can specifically go, you know, across the ocean to, to do. You just sort of have to capitalize on the t any time that you're in the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there was one point when he was over here. I think we were both working with Sam Amadon and we, he asked me to set up a jam session um and that was the first session for chrononaut him martin and i and then the next day he had a spare few hours and we just went to my house and played some guitar for a bit and it's funny the the least considered bits of it ended up becoming the best bits and the the ones where suddenly we knew what it was becoming uh, made the sessions a bit more difficult um there's a sort of truth when you don't know what you're doing that makes sense, but but it brings me back to the question of um, what did you get from Morton Feldman and the funeral music? How what kind? How did that affect your improvisation? How what what kind of? Because I was going to ask you about visitations, both of them actually. What kind of structures? Were there any structures? Visitations has a real through line to it. I mean, for for improvisations that were done over a period of time, they, you know, they, they have a sound to them. I mean, there's, you know, you, I don't know if you're on the right and he's on the left and, and, and yeah, there's very few effects, but what, it, what, what was the, what were the, but there's a sound to the way the improvisations are going. I mean, there's so many, as we know, there's so many directions an improvisation could go. I mean, you know, you could start slamming your strings or scraping or playing flurries of notes or, but there's none of that. 
there's a very considered, each of you is playing very considered notes against the other person. How does that derive from the funeral music and or Morton Feldman? Well, um, sometimes it's helpful to have a, a principle from which you're both starting. And that's one thing that the oblique strategy cards, for example, are very useful for. I actually wrote my own set of oblique strategies for improvising musicians. And we use some of those in this. But of course, once you start communicating with another musician, you find a common, um, you find common subject matter, it just sort of settles and starts to feel right. But that language is also defined by some principles which you might have talked about before. And I think that I actually think that even if I'd never spoken to Shazad and um, Martin about Morton Feldman and Maddo, it, it still probably would have ended up sounding quite like it does sound. But somehow the, having some principles, it's almost like it gives you a confidence that is helpful in improvising. It's like a kind of permission. It's a bit like with, with children, how they want to be very free, but they need to also know where the boundaries are because it helps to feel safe and i mean it can be really exciting to sit down and play with people where you know literally nothing but then it seems sometimes people kind of bring their own game kind of thing whereas this i wanted to structure these improvisations more like people are working towards a common idea so what morton feldman and maddo have in common is a sort of cyclical rhythmic um concept I mean, it's not the Mado is cyclical and Morton Feldman is like a series of cycles, but. Gosh, you just froze. Oops. Um. You just froze for a minute, so I don't know if you were talking. Oh, you're, you're actually, you froze, and I thought he's, I thought he's either listening really hard or he's frozen. <laughs> no, you were, what, what was the last? You were talking about the, the cyclical, yeah. um, that Morton Feldman was cyclical cycles. Oh, there it goes again. Oh, well, yes, yeah. I'm Maddo, which is funeral. My, I think mine's okay. Uh, how is it now? Um, seems to be working. Okay. <laughs> I'll edit, I'll edit well, it if there's, you know, glitches. Yeah. So cyclical. Yes. Um, Mado is funeral music from Tajikistan and the rhythms are based. The rhythms are cyclical. They're like ri small rhythmic units that go around and around and somebody improvises poetry on top of it. The poetry isn't improvised, it's it's Sufi poetry, but the melodies are sort of improvised. And Morton Feldman, often you find these rhythmic units in long sequence. And there's a ritualistic quality to his music for me, which also the uh, classical musician friends of mine who play his music a lot also find in, in the performance of his music. So this is a way out of the kind of linear concept of um improvising because i mean I'm, I'm not trying to set up straw man arguments i'm just saying the thing that i that i sometimes fall into is that either you're in a linear um world and uh, mode which unfortunately tends to mean that you sort of start quietly and then get big and then maybe have a quiet bit at the end um or maybe not or you're in this sort of amorphous um, sound space. And amorphousness is absolutely fine, but it's not always satisfying. And what I liked in these two musics is that it feels um, like it's not going anywhere. And yet it's very focused. Um, I think that's it. It's like a stillness, which I suppose is, is quite meditative in a way. Um, so that's what those 
have in common. And I was also interested just in repeating units that you couldn't write down. I mean, you find this in all ethnic or traditional musics to a degree, but, and you also find it in free jazz, you know, it's this, this rhythm that comes from like talking or water or something. But instead of it being loads of information, I wanted to make, investigate it being um, almost like frozen and explored. And, and the other um, thing that really excited me about the possibility of involving Morton Feldman's principles in improvisation was the harmony, because I know very little about jazz harmony. I mean, I kind of know what it is, but I don't know how to do it. And I found myself trapped in either um, diatonic major minor stuff or like art rock type harmony or just something which seemed like a really bad approximation of, of bebop harmony, which I didn't like anyway, actually. And Morton Feldman's harmony is so free and beautiful and interesting. It's free of any rules. Like he's not a serialist composer. Um, he's not a, he doesn't use dodecaphony or, uh, or, um, Oh God, what do you call it when you have the two keys at the same time that Stravinsky did? I can't remember. Sorry. Well, um, is, is... No, that one. No, it's um, polytonality, I think. Anyway, um, Morton Feldman's harmony in, in really reductive terms is clusters. And so if you imagine like on a piano playing C, C sharp, D, E flat as a four note cluster, which is actually one of the motifs in his piece Tragic Memories for piano. And he'll explode those out. So he'll play a low C and a very high C sharp and then a, a D in the middle. So you end up with this sort of dissonance, but it's it's dissonance with space and it's very playful. Like his his approach or one of his approaches was take a unit, like a unit of harmony or a unit of um, rhythm and look at it from another angle you know invert it or what if the notes are in a different order or it's like considering an object and turning it around and i i just i don't know if you know this is already something that has existed and i just didn't find it but i found it really liberating for improvisation because it's like curiosity about this little compelling object that you found and all of the pieces on um, visitations are that and and Shazad totally was on board with that and uh, with the other record Chrononaut that was my part in it but I think everybody else was kind of more or less doing their own thing yeah given that uh, I, I think Chrononaut holds together brilliantly I mean it it's but getting back to visitations for a moment, um, I mean, there's definitely a sense of space in it. And the, the turning the object around that you were talking about, that reminds me of cubism in a sense. You know, you're looking mm. at all angles at the same time. But mm. you're, but the music, the result on visitations is a real minimalist uh, spatial attitude. And, uh, and, it, but there's a, it's, it's what you were talking about that, um, like it doesn't go anywhere, but you can tell that it's intensely considered. Every bit of it is intensely considered. And, mm. and, um, yeah, I just, I, I'm still trying to figure it out. I mean, I've listened to it a couple of times and trying to f figure out, but you guys are obviously on the same page that, um, just the way the two guitars interact. Was he playing straight regular guitar? Yeah, we we sometimes would use uh, different tunings, but Shazad more than me. Um, but we were trying to figure it out as well. And to me, that's a compelling sound. Is the sound of people trying to work stuff out. I mean, I've always enjoyed that about going to experimental concerts. The, it's not so much the chance that it can go wrong. It's that you're hearing, you're not hearing something that someone's prepared earlier. Although, of course, it's in some sense being prepared for for your whole 
life. But I mean, I was quite worried about releasing that record because there's so many mistakes on it. Like we're both making bum notes, not bum notes in terms of the wrong, wrong note, but like finger slipping off the fret or hitting the open string by mistake and all of this. But it's really, truly, it was just like having a conversation with someone, which is what I think improvisation should be about, really. Of course. And and the, I mean, the nature of that music is, you know, how do you know? It's like John Abercrombie once said about Bill Frizzell. How do you know when he's done tuning? You know, it's 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 the name. <laughs> Well, well, the nature, you know, when Bill plays, you know, when anybody plays more out type music, it's and Bill, I mean, Bill has a tendency to just ease into his sets. If you've ever seen him live, you know, he oh, yeah. will be tuning and then all of a sudden he's playing and and uh, and depending on what he's playing, the, the line can be very can be very blurry. Um yeah, well, the, to me, the interesting thing about that blurry line is that a master like him even tunes immaculately. You know, it's someone who can't make a bad sound. And, well, I know he, well, I'm sure he doesn't intend it this way, but I think that that's, it's such a great um, framing of what art can be about, you know, it's, it should bring you out of the concert hall and into the, it should bleed into the rest of your life, you know? Uh, that's a good way so, to put it. Yeah. Screw John Abercrombie. <laughs> <laughs> John, I'm sure John was, John was very, a very funny man. And he was, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't mean it. He was, uh, yeah, he used to do a great Bella Lugosi imitation, but he's, uh, I'm sure he was just being funny and caught in that moment. Cause I, I know, you know, they, they knew each other. Um, mm. but I was going to ask you, are you at a point where you can play when you're doing this kind of thing? Are you playing is each note considered? Are you playing what you're hearing in your head? In other words, you're responding to um, to Shazad, but you, you know, you hear what he plays and then you you know what note you're going to play. You know, in other words, you're you're at the point on guitar. What I'm trying to say is where, you know, if you hear it, you can play it, whatever that is. I, I don't have the best ear by any means. Um, and I think Shazad would be modest enough to say the same. I mean, compared to some guys out there, I've got really, I've got pretty good relative pitch, but I don't have perfect pitch. And How can I describe it with someone, isn't it? You, you know roughly where they're going to go. And you also have your own thing going on. So I think what tended to happen in those improvisations, because we were thinking about these small cycles, we both establish a sort of a principle. Like I would be playing a wide um, minor ninth. Uh, or and and then a, a like a very narrow minor second or something in different parts of the guitar and he'd start with something else and they'd be sort of unrelated and in diff and deliberately in different times and then somehow just like two different size cogs you know they overlap and a lot of the time at least in that project it was about trying not to get distracted by how nice it sounded that there were these two things which weren't in time you know with each other and the loveliest thing is when you there's a few points on the record where we end up sort of playing exactly the same notes at the same time and uh well it's just it's fortuitous i suppose but um yeah it was a different kind of impro improvising because yeah there was a lot of listening but the most successful ones, it just felt like we were in the same world, but kind of doing our own thing. And it's very playful. Um, yeah, it has that it has that sound and um, and do the nature of the kind of music you're talking about where you're saying, you know, I mean, there there kind of are no wrong notes if, if you're playing that. It's it's if you play them with intention and and. Uh, or as you know, other people have said, you're only a half step away from the right note. So depending on how you resolve it, it can work also. I suppose so, but 
I do believe that there's a quality which anyone can feel of whether the players are in the zone or not. Like it's the difference between hearing something that you just don't like, but you can tell that it's good and just hearing something that's bullshit. And you, you can frame things a lot of different ways. And in some ways the frame is very important because you, once you say this is the track, then that's the track. Um, but you can't rely on that. I mean, when I was listening back to all the takes, it was so, so clear when the, the music came into focus. Um, I mean, we didn't just sit down and that album came out. We played a, for a long time. It was, we were both quite far out of our comfort zones and therefore there was lots of stuff that just didn't work. But, um, it just makes the bits that do work all the more precious, really. Well, that's interesting. That reminds me of what Eno is fond of saying, which is, you know, people hear the final result and think, oh, they just did that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he just did that and it came out. Isn't that amazing? But uh, yeah, I, I, I would, I, as you say, it's pure improvisation and it's not spe specifically edited into something, but you did edit out the you know, what Ivan Arset once called the good bits, you know, you play together <laughs> and then you just pull out the good bits and that's what you play. Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant edit out the good bits. <laughs> no, 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 you yeah, ed edit, you cull the good bits from it. So uh, what guitar were you using? What were you, were you playing straight into an amp? Um, we just both DI'd straight into the desk. Really? So, yeah. So in the, that was, that was my idea. No, the, the, that was my intention because I felt like definitely I, and to a lesser extent he, were somewhat associated with effects. And I just wanted to see what would happen if we took all of that away and just made it as naked as it can possibly be. And I actually really, I mean, for a long time, I really liked the sound of DI'd guitar. I think it's beautiful and pure and so that's what we did. All the guitars are just straight into the board. And I didn't even want to use reverb, but I, I couldn't deny that in the end it made it sound nice. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I was playing my, in the UK sessions, I was playing my Trussart Tele, and Shazad was playing my 68 SG. And in the New York sessions at Shazad Studio, I was playing one of his Tellies, I think, and he was playing... Um, a strat. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. You have such a, it has a unified sound, but, and, and the guitar sound really good. I mean, were you, did you have a really nice preamp in the, in the desk that you were running through? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was good quality gear, but the hard thing about, um, or the problem to solve in that way of doing things is that an amp naturally cuts out a lot of the unwanted sort of mudgy frequencies and also tame some of the super high frequencies. And um, it was actually quite hard to mix. I thought, I'm, go I'm going to be able to mix this really quick. And I mixed it about three times, that record. And I just couldn't quite get it to get the frequencies to balance. And I realized, oh, yeah, that's why people plug guitars into amps, because it just <laughs> takes care of it for you. But in the end, there's a sort of tactile quality, and it, and it was just, although the signal path is very simple, the mix was quite complicated, and there was a lot of multiband compression on the on the low mids, and um, not really extreme EQ, but quite extreme control. All right. So you basically ended up making it sound as if they were going through some sort of. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> yeah, but, it took, it took a long time. But but. Uh, <laughs> But no, I, I mean, direct can be beautiful and direct can work really well. And, you, and you, the end result sounded great. And But it's on um, Acts of Union on that. It sounded like there's a freeze pedal going or something like that. Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yes, that was uh, that was the day that I bought the plus pedal. Oh, okay. And for some reason that that um, that track, it was the only one of the tracks we did that had a really solid structure and development over nearly 10 minutes and i suppose i just thought well i'm not going to let the fact that there's a plus pedal on it not 
make me put it on the album. Right. <laughs> were there were there other tracks with effects that you didn't put on the record? No, there weren't because after we recorded that, I thought, oh, I shouldn't use that anymore because it's not in the concept. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the only one. I'm curious. Have you have you tried the freeze or super ego uh, pedals also? And how, what do you? I've asked some other people this. What do you think is the difference between that and the plus? The plus pedal, I mean, I guess they work. They must work on different principles. But the plus pedal is just so musical. Like the super ego sounds cool, but it's quite aggressive in a way. And the plus pedal. I guess it works by by sampling in granular synthesis tiny portions and then crossfading them or something. But for some reason, it just works in a musical and controllable way, and also in a sort of predictable way, which is handy, because if you want to make a reliably beautiful sound, then you can. And having the control over the decay and attack and stuff, I mean, it's just it's really fantastic. Yeah, I'll have to try one out. Um, so, yeah, I think you discussed my next question with how Chrononaut was put together. Um, yeah. Has, oh, yeah. The big thing on that record in terms of your guitar playing, I hear a lot of what sounds like a ring modulator. Right. Is that what you were playing through, a pedal? or? A... Um, not a lot. Uh, I think there's one track where it is ring thing, but... My um, my setup for that for those sessions was uh, guitar signal into pedal chain and amp, and then a parallel guitar signal into my laptop, where I had these audio racks of Ableton effects, um, and somehow having those two strands almost seemed to generate its own music because a lot of the effects in Ableton. Um, like time stretchy granular synthesis effects so you can play you can be playing your part out of the amp and it's sort of generating this weird automatic accompaniment out of the computer um so i think probably a lot of the things that sound like ring mods are actually more it could be like echo bode or like you know fm synthesis or it could be um there's this really great plugin called Sandman, made by Plugin Alliance, which has a, you can automate it to do time stretching things within the delay circuit. So yeah, it's mostly, I would say. Right, because I, I mean, there's, I, I heard it on Mob Kindu, something that sounded like that, and on Leaving Alhambra. Um, oh yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's all time stretch stuff. Actually, the other plugin I use a lot is Permutate. But when you pull out those sounds like that, it does give it a quality of either a very bell-like pure quality, which is characteristic, I suppose, of ring mods, or a sort of slightly uh, dissonant bell-like um, like overtone type sound. Um, yeah. Yeah, that may all also explain... Um why i was going to ask you you say there was no overdubs but it sounds often like there's two guitars playing or two separate yeah so is that what i'm hearing is that your guitar throat going through the pedal chain and then the other one is your guitar going through the laptop doing a separate set of things yeah yeah um yeah it was really really fun to play that way and um I'm going to investigate that more. Like I'll probably make another record with Martin, but um, yeah, it's, I was really strict about that. I wanted it to be um, like a trio, you know, I didn't want to get into overdubs. I think it's kind of a reaction against or a balance maybe to me being a producer and fussing over overdubs and stuff. I wanted to do something that sounded um quite full but that but that was really of the moment and it was a lot really a lot of fun to have this be only sort of semi-controllable it's, like, it's almost like you're feeding in information the harmonic information and it's responding and really the genius of martin is that he plays with that output as if it's a, a human being you know 
Right. He's responding to both of you, so to speak. Yeah. yeah, he's responding to the rhythms in the time stretch. Never really thought about it like that. But yeah, he's it's amazing. I mean, he's one of those people. He's so good. It just flatters you to play with them. You know, yeah. he's a great, great musician. Yeah, he sounds terrific on the record. And, and that sort of stuff is fun. I mean, I've been doing a lot of that with the iPad, you know, as, oh, yeah. as part of the laptop setup, you know, and there's so many granular things like eye density will, you know, it will process, but I haven't, fi if there's a way to set it up so that it comes back at a particular time, I haven't figured <laughs> out what that is. So this granular, you know, response to what I played will come back, you know, wherever I set it, an octave up, a fifth up or whatever, but kind of randomly. And, and, uh, and, uh, do you know Knox Chandler? Have we ever talked about that? Oh yeah. Yeah. He's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, when I did the interview with him, um, we talked about that, and he was saying that's one thing he likes about those plugins and things like that is that they're they're not as predictable, they're not you know as as programmable to where you can get it to do exactly something. You have to respond to what yeah. they do. Yeah, and it works. I think it worked great on that record. I mean, it sounds it sounds amazing. Um, there's some pitch pitch shifting things going up and down but it doesn't sound like a whammy pedal i think that was wow thanks a lot for listening to it you've really listened to it oh yeah <laughs> i love that record <laughs> that's the ring thing the okay. um, electro harmonics yeah, it's sure. amazing that pedal it's got such a great whammy the, the fact that you can just play a note and then tune the ring mod is just wildly great and I mean, I'm a bit obsessed with ring mods. I've got so many different, I've investigated so many different brands and everything, but I think that's the best one that's ever been made, that ring thing. It is amazing. I used, it used to be a staple on my board. It was basically my H9 because it also did a great <laughs> yeah, yeah. vibrato, a great yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. um, uh, univibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that tuning uh, thing was great. And it's just, yeah, it's a really underrated pedal. Um, there's also sections where it sounds like you're the, whatever pitch on the ring mod type thing is, whatever that's doing is kind of being blended in and out. So do you, do, did you mm. have something set up to blend more or less of it in, or is that just switching different things on? I think it probably, I mean, I don't, I can't place that in my mind, but I think it must be to do with this split signal thing. Right. And on I'm sorry. No, no, go, carry on. I was going to say on Convocation, um, it, it's listed in the credits as just, there's no bass player listed. Was there somebody playing? Oh, no, that's, oh, this is fantastic. You really did listen to it. <laughs> no, that's um, the whole start of that song. The bassist bit is from is being generated from the guitar part inside the laptop. Okay. Um, and I couldn't believe it when it was coming out because it it's just basically some slice and dice granular plugin and then i was pitching that down after the fact and somehow all the delays added up so that it ended up being like this weird you know bass accompaniment to what i was playing um and very annoyingly i can't find that ableton session anymore <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the sounds i have they're just not it's just not on my computer anymore well you'll just have to uh take a your a page from uh your friend brian eno who you know <laughs> yeah. never saved any presets on his dx7 because he never wanted to you know do the same thing again that's what i tell myself anyway when i lose stuff like that well actually i'm gonna i'm gonna have to add to the mythology here because i heard another story from someone who was there and he had these dx7 cartridges which had his sounds on and somehow one of the um engineers wiped it and apparently he just went and this was like you know how carefully he makes those sounds it's nice. and how hard it is to program a dx7 it's precious and he he said that brian just went quiet for a bit and then said that's good because that means i have to make new sounds yeah. <laughs> so it is consistent but i yeah he wasn't above saving a few sounds <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I would, I would be, I wouldn't, I'm not surprised. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, was there a lot of, was there much post? Um, did you do much 
work on the guitar and post at all? Zero. Okay. It was, I was really adamant that it should be like mixing a live gig. Um, so beyond volume balancing, there was nothing. Right. Yeah. And there's one track on there actually where Martin was playing so loud that his drums were bleeding through my pickups and getting into all of the granular stuff. And he, when he heard my first mix of it, he said, what the hell did you do to the drums? It sounds great. And I said, nothing. <laughs> That's my guitar <laughs> channel. I can't do anything about it. So it's a good thing you like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's perfect for that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you, you know, told me about that record because A, I love it. And B, mm. it, it turned uh, me on to that label. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which, I, you know, I, I mean, it's not like I don't have enough music to listen to, but there seems to be so much amazing stuff. They have, they're putting out something by a pedal steel player out of uh, Oakland that I contacted them about because I just did a thing with Susan Alcorn. Do you know who she is? Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. She's yeah, great. Yeah. I just interviewed her and we, you know, I'm, I'm, this is kind of a bet noir of mine is that the pedal steel is one of the most amazing instruments ever invented. It has this enormous potential. And most of the time it's used, you know, to play beautiful stuff on country music, but nothing yeah. else. You know? I mean, yeah. you have a few people like Susan, you have Greg Lees, you know, Greg right. Lee, but Greg Lees, I mean, he uses it almost country style within, within I was just listening to the new Charles Lloyd and the, uh, band with Frizzell and, and uh, Greg Lees and you know he, he plays beautiful stuff but in terms of really using it in a way that's that makes use of what it can do in a context that has nothing to do with it I mean I would I was pushed down that road by a pedal steel player I played with in San Francisco in a mm. band out there who learned pedal steel because he thought it would sound good on King Crimson tunes. And so mm. in the band we were in, he was running it through synthesizers and effects and, and I, which brings me actually to, um, to that, that segues really nicely into the next section. Cause I was watching that video with you and uh, Vadim Shiro. Oh, right. Yeah. You know, uh, in Russia and uh, I'm, I, at times it's really hard to make out who's playing what. And I know when I used to play with David, sometimes I'd lose track because we were both doing such ambient affected yeah. stuff that sometimes I didn't know if what I heard was something I had just played or something he had just played. And I was curious if you ran into that playing because uh, Vadim processes that percussion stuff so beautifully and so intensely that I couldn't really yeah, tell yeah, if it was yeah. you or him a good deal of the time. Yeah. Well, and also because I guess his microphones would be picking up what I was doing and uh -huh. yeah, he just kind of worked with that. Yeah, that was, an, I mean, that whole tour was an amazing experience. It was doing, I, I did um, 16 shows with no breaks all in different parts of Russia. And I'd, after my solo set, I'd, I'd play with a different person each night in each town. It's very interesting experience, and that was one of the more successful ones. Um, but yeah, it's a strange moment, that isn't it, when you uh, you're not quite sure what you're doing <laughs> or what <laughs> you're. No, I shouldn't say that. That's that's most of the time. Yeah. But in, when you're not quite sure what aspects of the sound you're responsible for. Right. Usually, I just try and keep doing roughly what I'm doing, <laughs> if I it know, sounds but... good. Yeah, I know it can be uh, it can be very disconcerting, but it's so much fun. I mean, I've had that experience, you know, a number of times and uh, it's really a lot of fun. Um, I want to ask you about the Russian tours because I found it just before uh, we talked. I found another another what seemed to be another Russian tour from. Well, no, maybe it was from the same year. Was this all in 2016? Oh, no, there was I did one tour with with Amaral Avatar of Russia I think that was 2016 and then I did one last year in November that was oh me not, yeah solo yeah it's the way they set up the dates you know over on oh, your yeah, side yeah. of the pond I you know I keep oh yeah yeah which is the year and which is the day but do you speak Russian because it looked like you were actually speaking Russian in that video uh... It's, it's been like my unfulfilled lifetime dream to speak Russian because part of my family is Russian, but they 
they they were Russian Jewish and they left in in one of the pogroms around 1905. But I, I feel this big affinity with Russia um, and Russian art and language. But no, my language skills are terrible, but I still found it fun and, and interesting to try and say a few phrases uh, from the stage. Yeah. Yeah, my family's from Russia as well, so I oh, have, right. yeah, have an affinity. Um, but also when you're playing with him, well, that, that actually from what you've said, I'm not sure this is the case, but it seemed like he plays a lot and processes mm -hmm. a lot. So how do you react in situations like that in terms of how do you think about fitting in to what he's doing? Well... I must admit, I can't quite remember uh, how that gig felt. But, well, or I think in there's general, two... you know, if you're working uh, yeah. with someone like that. Well, I think there's two things. The first one is there's two ways of being busy. There's, there's a, a busy that fills up all the space, and there's a busy that is like the busyness of a river or something. You know, it's not still, but it allows, it allows, um, that it, it invites an, something else on top of it or under it or within it. Um, if it's the second one, then it's not so hard to work out something that's complementary. But the second thing is that, I mean, unless something's working so well that you're just lost in it, and it's beautiful, which is, of course, is what we all hope for. Then I guess a lot of the time you're kind of analyzing what to do. Um, but I must say, it's got to a point with me now, probably from learning through doing, making bad contributions, that if I'm listening to the result, uh, if if it's if nothing is needed or if I don't have any ideas, then I won't play anything and that did actually happen to me a couple of times in this Russian tour and sometimes that was just because the the guy I was playing with was so outrageously good that I thought I can't add anything this is just complete music and if he's not making a space for me then let let him play because it sounds great and unfortunately a couple of times it was because it was so depressing that I, <laughs> I didn't want to <laughs> I didn't want to put anything in it yeah. Um, but I can understand the former. Uh, yeah, there's a great story about Skunk Baxter, Jeff Baxter from the Doobie Brothers, who got called to uh, do a session, and they said, well, listen to the track. And, okay, what do you think it needs? And he said, nothing. That'll be $300. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You know, And it's well worth it, because if he was right, then he didn't you know, fill it up with a lot of garbage. Um, do you mind if I just tell you my Robbie Shakespeare story? which is somewhat related. Oh, no, not at all. Please do. You know, Robbie Shakespeare from Sly and Robbie. He, I amazingly, through Brian, ended up on a Grace Jones session years ago with Sly and Robbie. And Brian was there, obviously. And I think everyone just sort of saw me as almost like this limpet, physical sort of limpet of Brian and didn't pay me much attention. But I did still get to see the session and play with Sly and Robbie. But... What I wanted to tell you was that there was this one tune, actually it's called William's Blood, it's an amazing tune on that record, and it was time for Robbie to overdub the bass. And the tune is very complicated, it's long and it has a lot of key changes and stuff like that. And he just sat back on the sofa with his bass, and the first playthrough he played like maybe three notes, and they weren't the right notes. He just goes, play it again, and play it again. And it wasn't, he was not learning the verse, the bridge, the chorus. It was some other thing that he was doing. It was like, it was like watching a Polaroid photograph develop. So he didn't get the verse and then the chorus. He just suddenly got the whole thing. And on, on the like fifth or sixth run through, it was just perfectly beautiful. But at one, at one stage in that um, development, the producer thought he was in trouble and said, well, you know, maybe Robbie on the chorus, you could play, you know, dun, 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 dun. And Robbie said, me could. 
but me never would. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. I didn't know they did another. That's a what year was this? Because they did three amazing records with Grace Jones, but um, this uh, must have been later. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not that old. <laughs> no, was, you're not. Uh, that's why I'm thinking. Who who, who is producing that one? Because I have to check it out. It sounds. It had a lot of different producers. I can't tell you who said that thing because. Um, no, 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 no. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but um, no, there were a lot of people in the room who were guiding the process, and it turned out to be a great album. But it was it was called Hurricane, and I think it was in no, 2007, maybe. Oh yeah, I, I think I remember. I remember that record. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you checked out, by the way, the Nils Peter Molvar stuff with Sly and Robbie? Oh, no. I'd love to hear that. Oh, they did a whole, they did a tour with him and Ivan and... Um, I oh, forget, wow. I forgot the guy's name. It's a guy who does remixing and percussion. Yeah. Um, was the third guy and Sly and Robbie. And it's, wow. Yeah, it's, it's great stuff. There's a whole YouTube concert of them i don't know why i didn't know about that i'm, I'm definitely gonna that's what i'm gonna do after this phone call who can keep up you know i mean that's that's the no. problem there's so i mean i, I learn I'm, i've learned so about so much new music just from you telling me about stuff and things um speaking of telling me about stuff so your is your live set up pretty much the same like on that russian tour where you're i know you split the laptop out um, you split your signal between the pedals and then go into the laptop and do separate processing? No, what I did on the Russian tour was um, it was all in the box. And, well, there are various reasons for that, but I'm not really sure it was a good decision. <laughs> um, I sort of got it in my head that I wanted to make this kind of virtual pedal board controlled by um, one of the GT you know, um, what's it called, MG, right. RJM, the right, GT RGM. MIDI controller. And I mean, it was cool. I, I did get some great sounds out of it. And I also had MIDI guitar, that plugin set up. So I was playing drums on it and it was good. But it, to be honest with you, it felt a bit like a party piece and there wasn't enough really viable music in it for me. Um, so yeah, my setup was completely in the box. Um, it was very interesting to go and play that music there. And it operated on some of the same principles as what we were speaking about earlier. Um, it was an amazing thing, actually, yes, to, to have to do it. I'm not a solo improviser. I mean, I thought I'm going to learn something doing that. It was tough. And um, So you were using a, um, a, an amp modeler for kind of straight type amp sounds. And were you splitting it, trying to split it off as you did with the, uh, with the amp and the laptop going through the PA? Um, no, there, I mean, there was no amp. So no, I, I, I know. Going... But I mean, within the box, in other words, were you doing part oh. running through an amp thing with pedal type effects and then splitting off the granular stuff so that you could play along with it in you know inside the box oh i see no i wasn't well i the first the first thing i decided was i didn't want there to be any looping so it's more like the signal goes in and then i can choose with the midi controller whether it goes into this chain of effects or this chain of effects or both um <laughs> And each song, I suppose, or, it, well, I was, I, I wanted each improvisation to have a sonic environment. So there's no material, but there's a sonic environment. So one of them might be like loads of sub and then a really fast gated, um, frozen thing. And then, uh, very clean DI guitar or something. I was trying to make scenes, I suppose, and just switch between these scenes and hope that something good came out. Um, but what I gave the engineer was just stereo out. They didn't have to do anything except push up the faders. And that was partly on purpose because you just never know what you're going to get at those, at different places. And when there's a language barrier, sometimes I just wanted, if I felt like the room needed some 300 Hertz taken out, I could just do it on, mm -hmm. on the mix bar. And it was, it was quite good for that. Right. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I mean, I thought in the, uh, 
the one with Vadim, I saw an amp behind you, but you weren't running through that. Ah, caught. Caught <laughs> out. When the, the, the solo part of the show um, was as I described, okay. but the second half was these collaborations. And in that, I would play through an amp because, uh, well, I'd have both. And the reason is that sometimes the sounds that I would get out of the computer would be so, they dictate a lot and they'd be quite complex. And in general, I prefer to fit into somebody else's vibe than make them fit into my vibe. So I wanted to have a simpler option, if you like. So in that situation, what were you running, still running uh, some of the laptop to the, uh, to the house? Yeah, it was there. Then I did have that split. Um, it was actually quite fiddly to set up because my whole pedal board wasn't set up that way. I had to plug things and stuff and it was not much fun. But um, it was good to have because I didn't end up using the laptop all that much in those collaborations because it just was too big, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've been, as you know, I've been doing this a long time as well, and I know you've been doing it a long time, and I've never been in a position where I was able to run the laptop separately to the PA and be confident that I would get monitoring that I you oh, know, could I see, trust yeah. and, and go out to the audience that I could trust. So I'm always curious, when you do that, the signal you're sending out through the laptop that's there's no amplifier it's as if you're going direct uh, i in, guess so yeah in that case so I, I was always curious if people use like i mean if i was going to do that i would probably use for that chain i would use an amp mo modeler you know to get <laughs> some of bring back some of that stuff but you're saying you basically would run it out direct just through whatever you know and i guess you'd as maybe with the visitations record, you compensate a little bit with some compression and some stuff. Well, like I mean, it was quite, the sounds from that tour were quite abstract. So in a way more similar to being a synth player or something. But one of the things that I've always found really hard to work out as a live guitar player in, in other people's bands and stuff is if you've got an amp and the PA and you're not playing at, at Wembley Stadium or something, then the people in the audience are hearing a combination of those two things at different distances. And in a bunch of venues like where it's, I don't know, 100, 200 people, the experience of someone in your line might be very different to someone just a few degrees off. So often I used to, in those sorts of gigs, I'd turn my amp to me and have it as quiet as possible because then I'd know that um, I'd have a greater sense of what was really going out into the house, you know. I mean, in a lot of bands, certainly when I was doing all my, like, touring with Roxy and Pulp and stuff like that, you just know that it's not your job in a way. You just know that it's going to be okay. But in in my own shows and stuff, I... Yeah, it was a bit weird having an amp. So when there's no amp and you're just sending the signal out, then all you're really, all you have to worry about is your own monitors. And if they're no good, then that's a pity. But if you've sat at home and listened to these sounds and you know that they're good, then it's going to be okay, isn't it? Hopefully. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Because, I mean, I've done, I've, I've done those gigs. I know exactly what you're saying. First of all, playing live for everyone is so fraught on so many levels, you know, in terms of getting the sound that you like. And I guess with bigger bands, what you would do is basically, you know, you ha if you have an amp on stage, get the sound that sounds good to you on stage. So you feel comfortable playing. And then that's the end of your responsibility. It's up to whoever's doing yeah. front of house to get it out to, you know, them. But in terms of doing the electronic thing, I've now done it both ways. I mean, my solution when I'm sending it out, you know, if I'm just sending using an amp model and sending it out directly into the PA would be to use headphones so that, oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I can actually hear for sure because monitors, who knows what you're going to get. Um, and but then last I think the last couple of times I did it, I used two amplifiers and just did it stereo through amplifiers. Oh, nice. And it was uh, 
Yeah, it's a very different experience and it's a different sound, you know, and, and depending on what you're using, though, it can be problematic because, you know, I mean, use I love using um, Ableton's filter, their filter to make rhythmic kind of almost bass lines, you know, just using it in sync and really doing a square wave and really it, it creates some great rhythmic things, although mm. figuring out where one is can be problematic, but <laughs> but it works really well, but it also can hit some serious subs and, and you know, amplifiers, you know, I'm not about to bring two dual showmans with me or yeah, two yeah, bass yeah. amplifiers, like, like Steon Vesterhaus, you know, oh, yeah, you yeah. heard his stuff, I mean, he... Mm. He's playing through like two twins and two SVTs, so he can hit the low end as much as he wants, and and uh, and he knows he's not going to blow anything up. So it's still it's still all a work in progress. Um, you know, another guy, Dan Phelps, has an interesting solution. I mean, he goes to an amp, but he runs out of the amp head into that Paul Rivera, um, not Paul Rivera, um, oh, the guy makes. David Torn's amps. Um, I'm trying. I can't remember the name right off the top of my head, but it's a. It's like a an attenuator, but also a direct out. So he mm. he hears his amp down the center, and then runs the laptop stuff. He gets his amp sound going into the laptop, but then coming out of the laptop, it goes to two powered speakers. Oh right. So he yeah, gets that's... all the effects in stereo, you know, but they're powered by. So the pedals go into the amp and then out of a speaker, but then the amp goes into these two power things for all the stuff. So, yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of solutions that people do. And yeah, I think in a way it depends on what the end situation is going to be, you know, like what is the gig going to be like and stuff like that. I mean, I definitely thought about doing it Dan's way. I'm really intrigued by that. Um, but I just didn't really have a, this Russian tour wasn't going to be like that. Right. And somehow the, the thing that I really missed on that tour was the, it was the duality of having something that clearly is an amp and doing its own thing. And then this other thing, which is laptop. And that I've been actually doing that for a long time. Like that was my setup when I was in Roxy music and I really enjoyed it. And I had like in my own, cause the gigs were big. I had like my own mini PA on stage. It was just fantastic. But I like the separation and I mean, yeah, you mentioned the subs. You're absolutely right about that. But it's also the high end. Like, you just can't get that pristine and pleasant sounding, you know, 6K and above, say. Because um, an amp just doesn't reproduce it. Interesting to me about having both, you know, right. to be able to have, like, the the kind of pointed amp speaker curve but also have access to these kind of pristine tiny sounds um it sounds ideal and you know maybe someday when we go out and play again i'll get to do something like that yeah but um but uh speaking of someday um oh well, first of all a quick question i don't know if i ever asked you this who got the true sar first you or spedic chris spedic Oh, that's a good question. I think it must be that we both had them before we met. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I don't actually know when he got his, but we already both had them. Yeah. Um, and I was going to ask you, you mentioned somewhere in passing, I think when we were setting this up, that uh, I don't know if you can talk about it, but that you had things coming up with both Brian's, Eno and Ferry. Is, are either of them anything you want to talk about? When did I say that? <laughs> um, I think, you know, should I edit this out? <laughs> uh, Possibly, it was only, only for boredom, because, uh, um, I mean, with Brian, I don't really know, because he's not in town at the moment, you know, I mean, everything's just kind of shut down. Um, I don't have anything planned with Brian, I don't think. You know, we, some... we have to distinguish. Oh, sorry, know. yeah, sorry. We can't Brian, see the you know. spelling. <laughs> with Eno yeah I don't know I mean we're in touch but yeah. there might be some things that were started a while ago that are still like on the slate but he always has so many things going on I don't really know and Brian Ferry funnily enough uh, I got called to do a session with him just before Christmas and I hadn't seen him for like 14 years I was so surprised I to be honest I thought I'd been fired 
um, because on the last gig of the tour, me and all those years ago, Guy Pratt and I trashed our guitars and he didn't like it. <laughs> and te- technically we were fired. They weren't our real guitars. We went out to a cheap store and bought like $50 guitars. Anyway, it wasn't very big or clever, but it was fun. Um, and he didn't, he didn't like it. And I didn't hear from him again, basically. And, uh, but then he called me and we had an amazing time. It was so nice to see him again. And his voice sounds great. I mean, he's also very, it's also like, you know, in that he's always working on things, maybe not always as many things, but you know, he's very dedicated to his work, Brian Ferry. And, um, I think a lot, a lot of the stuff he's got now has, he's been working on for a while. I mean, it was wonderful. I feel, I felt very grateful to do that. Actually, it was, it was a nice feeling to see him again. Yeah, sounds yeah. great. And I, I mean, has he done much in the last fourteen years that I, I'm trying to remember? Yeah, I mean, he's released a record every few years, and and he tours a lot. He really that, loves touring. Yeah, I guess I've seen that. Yeah, he came through Nashville, and I I missed. Oh, it. did he? Yeah, I think he played the Ryman a couple of years ago. Right. Um, yeah, the last time I saw him was in in San Francisco or in Oakland. He played Oakland um, at that beautiful Art Deco theater. And unfortunately, one of the guitar players was behind. They had big speakers on stage and he was I, oh. I forgot who was on that tour. I know the the young kid. I don't know if he's a young. Kid yeah, anymore. Ollie. Well, he was really. on it. And uh, maybe he was the one that was behind the, the speaker. And then. Um, oh. And then his utility guy has been with him a million years. Alan Spenner was he, that him? Oh yeah, Alan Spenner. Yeah, oh, I, I think... mean he was he was not in it when I was in it, but yeah he he brings people back. You know, sometimes after a long time. I think Chris is doing it at the moment. I mean, yeah. not right at the moment, but right. they were also on tour, I believe, when COVID hit. So, do you have anything planned um, coming up? that you're working on session wise or, or remote? Are you doing any remote sessions? Yeah, I'm doing a few things. I mean, it felt like when COVID happened, there was this sort of wave of real, almost kind of defiant creativity. And it was, it was really busy. I I actually had a very busy lockdown, like mostly mixing and producing, but some sessions as well. And when, film sessions came back that was really exciting like when the studios opened again over here that was really nice um but now i think the reality the economic reality and also the um logistical reality of the fact that people who are making albums have to then go out and tour them has hit and so there's been created a sort of log jam and it feels like everything's kind of slowed down a bit um so at the moment, well, I have a couple of film sessions coming up uh, in a in a week or so, um, and I'm still doing production for people and mixing, and I'm I'm also trying to work on my own stuff. I I wrote a lot of new music last year, and I'm just not really happy with it yet. So I'm still just trying to zero in on on what it is, and it's just balancing that. To be honest, like I don't have the luxury that I can stop working you know really um especially because i'm building a studio at the moment obviously we all have to work and now it's kind of amazing to have any work at all considering what's happened for touring musicians so i'm just doing what what comes and using the downtime to try and make a record and is that in the studio you're building what 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 kind of studio where are you where what were they laying concrete for today well i found I moved house and I found this house, which is in East London, and it's quite unusual. It's a bit further out than when you and I met. Uh, It's another few miles out, but this house has a space at the bottom of the garden, and there was a building there which was falling down. It was made out of literally cardboard or something, but I thought, knock that down and we'll build a studio there. Uh, And we knocked it down, and underneath we found a bomb shelter from World War II uh not a very big one quite small and then later we found an, a bigger one that it was connected to under some other bit of the garden and all this was very exciting but very slow to you know solve and then we had various things like you know studios are very heavy because they have so much material yeah. density of material 
so the foundations have to be really strong and to get the foundations strong we had to do a lot of specific stuff and it just took ages i mean it's always been my dream to be able to work from home really and to make my studio feel like an extension of the house so that when artists come it feels like genuinely homely um and i was just so excited to find somewhere where that was even possible i've been looking for somewhere in london for a long time to do that and couldn't find anywhere so that's what i'm doing and hopefully now that we have concrete in in a few months it will really exist and i hope i will still have some work by then <laughs> I've, I've started to get frightened that i'm going to build this studio and then just sort of sit in it <laughs> and no one's going to come well, I mean, if nothing else, it will be a place to record for you to record for remote sessions. Um, you know, are you I mean, you say you are doing some of those where people call you for guitar parts or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I am. I really enjoy it. I mean, it's not the same, but it's surprising how much intimacy you can establish just by talking or writing and going back and forth a couple of times. I mean, I guess it's divided between people who know me and have known me for a while and need something. So they kind of trust me to know what they want. And then people who don't know me, uh, and then we just kind of get there, you know? I mean, there, ha there hasn't been absolutely loads, but it's ticked over. Um, and thank God, you know? Yeah, it's good to know you're working. I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, I feel, you know, particularly that some of us are blessed to be able to do that. I just feel so bad for, you know, the touring infrastructure. I mean, not just the artists that can't tour, but there's in Nashville, some of them uh, got together and, and put together this Christmas show, outdoor Christmas show. The, oh, really? The roadies and light guys and all the guy, you know, all the infrastructure guys. And yeah, they charge like 50 bucks a car to drive through and see all these decorations they put up and, you know, it was all synced to music and oh, amazing. Yeah. So it was just something to do. That's to great. Well, some money. Brian Ferry donated. He made a, a live record and donated the all of the proceeds to his crew, which I thought was extremely kind. I mean, it's brought out a lot of um, generosity and solidarity in people. But particularly over here now, there's a limit, you know, because with Brexit, it's for visa reasons, it's much harder now to go back and forth to Europe and play. And, and unless you're Brian Ferry or someone, it's not viable at the moment financially to tour at all because of the visa costs involved. So, just, um, well, I, I can't believe that it will be left unresolved for too long. But yeah, people are really having a hard time over here. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're hanging in there and and doing well. And which I want, let's sign off on the interview, and we can catch up a little more. But thanks oh, yeah. so much for doing it, Leo. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate it a lot.